Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. You hear a gastroenterologist talking to a patient called Simon Mortlake. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Now, Mr. Mortlake, I think you've been referred by your GP.、Mm -hmm. I've got your notes here, but perhaps you can tell me, in your own words, what seems to be the problem. What's brought you here today? Sure.、Um, well, it, it's not the first time I've been to this clinic. I was referred to one of your colleagues about three years ago. I had what I thought was a stomach ulcer, which had been troubling me for some time, and my GP suggested I came in for tests. And I had what he called an endoscopy. You know where they put a tube down your throat and、yeah. have a look at your insides, and as part of that, they also did a biopsy to make sure it wasn't something more serious. That's right, and that was clear. Yes, it was. Fortunately, I actually had a condition called Helicobacter pylori, and I went on a course of tablets for that. Right. Um, it was cleared up in no time. Very straightforward. But the consultant did say that I needed to be alert for any further symptoms.、Mm -hmm. You know that there's a greater risk of cancer developing after you've had that, and that I should come straight back if I had any problems. Oh, indeed. And have you had any other medical problems since then? Well, a couple of years back, I had a hernia operation. That was also very straightforward. I had that done just after I retired. I expect it was actually an occupational injury of some kind because quite a few of my colleagues have had similar problems. Okay. I was a police officer for most of my working life. Other than that, I keep relatively fit. I'm not taking any medication for anything. I've been well until just recently. Okay. So what's happened to change that? Well, I've started to suffer from indigestion, particularly after lunch or dinner. I get heartburn. You know, pain just here. I see. And are there any other symptoms? Well, I've also found myself running out of energy. I'm a keen gardener, and I'll be digging or whatever, and suddenly I feel a need to take a rest. I mean, that's not like me. I usually want to finish a job once I've started it, you know. But if I try to push myself too much, I start to get breathless, and that's a bit worrying, to be honest. I see. And are you aware of your weight changing at all? Not really. But what I have noticed is that I just don't seem to have such a good appetite any more. Right. I mean, that's partly being retired, I'm sure. But I do keep pretty active. It's just that I don't fancy the sort of big meals I used to eat.、Mm -hmm. I start to feel sick if I have too much. And are there any other pains or physical symptoms? Not really. I've been looking out for things like my stomach swelling up because I know that might be a symptom of something.、Yeah. But to be honest, I can't say I've ever had that. So, what do you think? Might be the problem. Well, the thing is, my uncle—that's my mum's brother—he had to have a gastrectomy, and I remember this is how it all started. I mean, the symptoms I've described, and well, I think these things can run in families, can't they? Well, they can. Anyway, the real reason that I want to get checked out is because I've got a big trip coming up. The wife and I have booked tickets on a cruise to Antarctica. I mean, it's the trip of a lifetime.、Mm. We're really excited about it. But I need to make sure I'm well. Okay. Well, I understand your concern. So what I need. Extract two, questions thirteen to twenty-four. You hear a vascular surgeon 
talking to a new patient called Monica Patterson. The questions 13 to 24 complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have 30 seconds to look at the notes. Hello, Mrs. Patterson. Your GP has sent you to see me because of some problems with your legs, is that right? Yes, varicose veins, and they've just been getting worse and worse. Right. Well, I've got some notes here from your GP, but I wonder if you could tell me in your own words when this started and what's happened so far. Well, I guess the first time I had problems with my legs was ages ago, when I was pregnant. My son's 25 now, so that shows you how long ago it was. <laughs> <laughs> but everyone knows that varicose veins goes with that, don't they? They look horrible at the time, but then they usually disappear again. And was that the case? Well, by about a year or 18 months later, they'd gone completely. My legs were looking and feeling fine, and I was back at work then too. Uh-huh. What do you do? I was a chef in quite a busy restaurant, so there wasn't much opportunity for sitting around in that job, Doctor, I can tell you. <laughs> but then, oh, um, it must be getting on for four years ago now, I noticed the veins were coming back. At first, I wasn't too concerned, although they seemed to get very scaly and they itched too around the calves. I tried to follow the advice you find on websites, you know, move around at work, try to keep your feet up on a stool and avoid crossing your legs. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did insist on getting a bit of exercise every day. I always managed to fit in walking around town after the lunch service, just for about half an hour or so. Mm, good. Uh, and what treatments have you had so far, Mrs. Patterson? I first went to see my GP just because they looked ghastly and I was a bit worried about them. But he said that he could only recommend proper treatment when they got worse and were painful or I had any complications. But um, he did tell me I should lose some weight. <laughs> That's an occupational hazard in my job. Good advice, though. Well, I did manage to get it down a bit. <laughs> Anyway, about a year ago, my left leg really swelled up. In fact, they both look pretty nasty with the bulging veins. And you can see now, mm -hmm. my feet and ankles are really swollen up. Yeah. Uh, also, when I'm in bed, I regularly wake up with terrible cramps. Uh, last night, I didn't know where to put myself. So... um then the doctor did an ultrasound scan to see if there was a blood clot. Uh, thankfully, that was all clear. But we agreed it was time to get my legs sorted. Yeah. Um, the doctor arranged for me to have some injections of foam in the veins. He said it was quite a new treatment. Mm. It was just with a local anaesthetic and I didn't have to stay in overnight, which was good. Uh, I had to wear bandages afterwards for a week or so, and then those um, uh, compression stockings yeah. for another week. And since then? Well, that seemed to do the trick at first. They felt much better to start with, although I had awful headaches for the first few days, which I gather happens sometimes. Mm. Um, anyway, uh, now they really seem to be worse than ever. So I'm back to square one. Uh. I'm thinking that either we have another go with the injections or maybe I need to consider surgery this time. Uh, that's obviously more invasive and I know from other people that I'd be very sore afterwards and would have to take time off work. Uh, that's a consideration too. I run my own hotel now, so I can't just close it for weeks on end, can I? Mm. So... Uh, what do you suggest now, Doctor?
That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best, according to what you hear. You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a nurse on an obstetrics ward talking to an obstetrician. Now read the question. Excuse me, Doctor, could I have a word about a patient? Sure. In room 12, we have Mrs Tate. She's a 35-year-old G3P3 woman who came in yesterday complaining of breast tenderness, bloating and mild nausea. Mm -hmm. Her last menstrual period was six weeks ago. She's married with three children under five and uses contraceptive pills for birth control. On physical examination, she is afebrile with a heart rate of 90 and blood pressure of 140 over 80. The urine pregnancy test has resulted positive and transvaginal ultrasound reveals a six-week size gestational sac with detectable fetal heartbeat. What's concerning me is that she's visibly distressed. The pregnancy was unplanned and she's anxious about the emotional and financial implications. She was on bed rest for six weeks during her last pregnancy and she's aware of the risks and difficulties of carrying this one to term. Would you be able to speak to her? Question 26. You hear a senior doctor giving a group of medical students training in how to conduct a physical examination. Now read the question. Today, I'm going to be demonstrating how to examine a patient's shoulder. So, you've taken a full history, which means you've got a fairly good idea what it is you're looking for, and it's time for the physical examination. Now, the thing to bear in mind is that the shoulder is an extremely complex joint, and there are many specific tests we can apply during an examination. Therefore, it's best not to jump to too many conclusions about the diagnosis. If you just go looking for that one thing, then you risk missing something else that might be there. So, how to conduct the examination? Well, you need to be organised and follow a set routine. The first thing is to ask your patient to remove their shirt or whatever to expose the area you're examining. Watching the patient do this is often quite instructive with shoulder problems because you can pick up whether they're actually guarding the shoulder as they do that and that might give a clue as to the possible nature of the pain or exactly where it's located. Question 27. You hear a GP talking to a patient about his mother. Now read the question. So, how can I help you today? I've come about my mum, actually. You know you referred her to the memory clinic? Yes, that's right. Well, the thing is, she went there and she's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I guess we should have known what was coming, but it still comes as a bit of a bolt out of the blue, to be honest. Oh, yes, I'm sure it has. Well, mum seems to be OK with it. It's me, really. I mean, I know what Alzheimer's is, but I don't know that much about it, really. So I thought it would be best to come and see what I ought to be doing. Mm. My mum lives on her own at the moment, and she's coping fine, but how long is that going to be the case? Is there anything I should be doing? You know, is it going to get worse? 
I mean, do I need to start putting things in place to help her, or is that just going to alarm her? Is she safe to look after herself? Should I be looking out for certain signs or anything? Okay, look, I understand your concerns. Before we go any further, though... Question 28. You hear two nurses discussing a patient's care plan. Now read the question. Shall we go over her care plan next? Sure. I'd say that the priority is some Lovenox training, because she's likely to be going home on that. She's been having a little bit of anxiety over this current hospitalisation and the recurrence of her condition after a period of remission. She's a high fall risk, and she's also been in acute pain. But uh, that's been well managed, so it's more about the anxiety. Did you have to give anything for that? She was OK without any pharmacological intervention, actually. We've been doing breathing exercises, and they're going well. OK. Anything else that we should be seeing too? If she can show us that she's able to handle the injections, then we can go ahead and move to sign-off. OK. Question 29. You hear a surgeon briefing his team before an operation. Now read the question. I think this patient could be quite a problem post-operatively. Is he taking oral medications? Yes, he's on phenytoin. OK, so if his gastrointestinal tract becomes unusable, we need to be ready to deliver that intravenously. The other issue with him is that from his records, I can see that he's actually had quite a bad time in the post-operative period on previous occasions. He was a heavy smoker, but claims to have cut down considerably. Even so, he's going to have a larger midline incision, so he may be someone that you want to consider for an epidural, because he's likely to be at the extreme edge of the pain threshold. We'll see at the beginning with the wound catheters and PCA. If necessary, we can do the epidural in the recovery room if he's in difficulty. Fine. Question 30. You will hear a dentist talking to a patient. Now read the question. So we're going to fit your implant today. Have you had any problems since your last appointment? Well, there was just one thing. You remember how hard you had to pull to get the impression off of my teeth once it had set? Yes, it is a very tenacious material. Well, the next day, one of my crowns dropped out. Uh, look, uh, I've got it here. Uh, do you think that was what caused it to happen? Oh dear, I'm sorry about that. I can probably refix it for you today if you want. These things do happen sometimes, I'm afraid. Oh, thank you. That'd be great. But actually, what I was wondering was if I might have an implant instead of that crown as well. I mean, it's the second time it's fallen out, actually. I've had it years. Oh, well, in that case, let's have a quick look at the tooth itself and see what might be possible. Thanks. That is the end of Part B. Now look at Part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, Choose the answer, A, B, or C, which fits best, according to what you hear. 
Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at extract one. Extract one. Questions thirty one to thirty six. You will hear an interview with a sports injury specialist called Toby Walsh on the subject of hamstring injuries. You now have ninety seconds to read questions thirty one to thirty six. My guest today is a sports injury specialist called Toby Walsh. We're going to be talking about hamstring injuries. Toby, hamstring injuries are something sports people at all levels of ability fear getting. Why is this? Well, you're right. Hamstrings are the most significant injury in a number of team sports, including football and rugby. But any sports person could be affected. I think, looking at the statistics, hamstring injuries account for the largest number of lost playing hours amongst professional footballers,、mm. even though the average injury only takes about three weeks to heal. More worrying for the individual is that once they've had such an injury, the chance of sustaining another one in the same season is as high as twenty percent. So it can become the thorn in the player's side.、Mm. That I think accounts for the reputation the injury has. So is this an injury that can affect any of us at any time? Well, the hamstrings are a group of muscles in the thigh that allow us to bend our legs and knees effectively. Now, some ethnic groups are more predisposed to these injuries than others, and everyone's chance of tearing the muscle increases with age. But apart from that, they're generally the result of short bursts of movement, like sprinting or suddenly changing direction, and they happen more in certain sports because these are just the sort of movements that players are making. They happen most often at the end of what we call the swing phase of running, just before the outstretched leg hits the ground and the muscles contract to bend the knee. But I'm sure there are ways to prevent these injuries. Well, looking after the muscles themselves obviously helps here. You can do various exercises that actually strengthen the hamstrings and so make them less prone to injury.、Mm. And of course, warming up before exercise is crucial in avoiding all sorts of muscle strains, and sports people know that. But that isn't the whole story. One interesting finding is that a lot of people who develop hamstring injuries have coexisting back problems, and there would seem to be a correlation. By loosening up the lower back, you also help the nerves that control the hamstring. Flexibility there allows the muscles to function as they should. And there are exercises people can do to help that.、Mm. And is the risk of hamstring injury something that should be taken into account in training programs? Well, yes.、Uh, intensive training of the sort you do for team sports like football can put quite a heavy workload on the gluteal muscles, which can lead to a tightening around the hips, creating knots known as trigger points. These, in turn, can cause referred pain in the hamstring, reducing flexibility and increasing the risk of straining or tearing it. I mean, basic stretching exercises can help here, but also we know that muscles are more likely to strain if they're fatigued. Often, during a period of intensive training, you get cumulative fatigue. This can creep up on an athlete on their muscular system over a number of weeks as the training intensifies. And、um, if an athlete does pull a hamstring, how can the sports injury specialist help? Well, they'll feel the pain, maybe even feel a pop, and they won't be able to continue because the muscle will go into cramp and spasm. There are three degrees of severity, and the treatment will vary according to that. 
Fortunately, as a sports injury specialist, you're often present when the injury occurs, or you can see it on video, so you don't have to rely on a verbal account of symptoms to assess the severity. Initially, you want to stop any swelling as soon as possible. That's your priority. You're going to apply compression bandages and possibly ice. Although there's some debate about that these days, it does ease the discomfort. And you'll certainly elevate the leg and make sure the patient rests up. And how long will the athlete be out of action? Well, as I say, that's going to depend on the severity of the injury. They'll have to rest up for 72 hours, whatever happens, to avoid causing further damage. And things like heat and massage can be just as damaging as movement itself.、Oh. Mm. A grade three injury can take months to heal and can be career-threatening for top athletes. What's more, lack of use can lead to the development of scar tissue and muscle shrinkage. In other words, the muscles won't return to their former state, even if the tear or strain itself heals. So part of my job is to ensure that doesn't happen by getting the muscles working again in the right way as soon as possible. Now look at extract two. Extract two. Questions thirty-seven to forty-two. You will hear a clinical pharmacist called Emma Royce giving a presentation about the side effects of certain types of medication. You now have ninety seconds to read questions thirty-seven to forty-two. My name's Emma Royce, and today I'd like to talk about some unanticipated side effects of certain widely used medications. The side effects that I'm particularly interested in involves changes in a patient's behaviour. In particular, the onset of what's known as compulsive or pathological gambling in patients suffering from Parkinson's disease. Pathological gambling is essentially an addictive disorder in which the patient feels a need to engage in financial risk-taking, in the expectation of gaining a reward. It is characterised by both recurrent and persistent behaviours, and can lead to significant distress and the breakup of personal relationships. The condition is thought to affect around 1.4 percent of the general population. A figure which rises to seven percent in Parkinson's patients. It was this finding that led to the realization that there was a link between the medication prescribed for that condition, notably dopamine agonists, and the onset of pathological gambling. So, how common is this side effect of Parkinson's medication? On the surface. It would seem that it remains the exception rather than the rule, only affecting around one in seven users, and not all of those in a severe way. Also, because only a small proportion of patients treated with dopamine agonists develop the symptoms, it may reflect specific predisposing factors. The exact level of incidence is unknown, however, and this may be because many cases go unreported. Patients themselves or family members don't admit to the condition out of shame, or because their doctors or carers haven't been able to identify it. And this could explain why it doesn't show up more frequently in pharmacovigilance reporting systems. Let me give you an example of a typical case: a 74-year-old male, let's call him Harry. 
who was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and prescribed the dopamine agonist Pramipexol. About a month after commencing treatment, he began to feel an increasing need to play slot machines until he was going to a gambling venue every day. At first, Harry was able to conceal his behaviour from family members, another common feature of the condition. His wife did notice other symptoms. Harry was having difficulty sleeping and wasn't finishing his meals,、uh, but she put these down to his Parkinson's. It was when Harry began impulsively buying items that he neither needed or wanted that his wife became alarmed.、Uh, it was at this point that the hole in his bank balance caused by the gambling came to light, and the couple was able to seek help. In other cases, heightened sexual activity has been identified as an indicator. There are several underlying risk factors for developing pathological gambling. At、male gender, a previous or family history of gambling, personality traits such as high impulsivity and high novelty seeking. The risk increases when such people take dopamine agonists as treatment for Parkinson's disease. Originally, research suggested that the higher the dose and the longer the duration of the prescription, the greater the likelihood of compulsive symptoms occurring. More recently, however, research into the use of the medication for another condition, restless leg syndrome or RLS, has shown that symptoms can develop even at low doses. So, what are the long-term effects of these adverse reactions? Pathological gambling seems to be reversible when the dose of the dopamine agonist is reduced, or the patient is transitioned to an alternative medication. Basically, dopamine agonists help Parkinson's patients by replacing the loss of dopamine in areas of the brain that control the ability to move. But the increased dopamine levels then affect other areas, such as the neural system linked to pleasure and reward behaviors and associated emotions, which then manifest themselves as impulsive and compulsive actions. But the effects are not long-lasting. Harry lost all interest in gambling within a month of stopping Pramipexol therapy. But sadly, for many patients, the problem isn't picked up before life-changing disruption is caused, as significant gambling debts develop and relationships become strained. So, what can we do to improve the management of these side effects? There's no doubt that Parkinson's is a serious and degenerative disease, so the drugs may represent a reasonable trade-off in terms of risk-benefit analysis. It's hoped that by educating patients and carers about potential side effects, it'll make them more willing to report changes of behaviour. Patients and their carers should be monitored closely for the symptoms. So that as soon as any side effects do emerge, the drugs can be tapered or discontinued. For other conditions such as RLS, however, it is open to debate whether the risks associated with compulsive behaviours outweigh the therapeutic advantages of administering the medication. What is needed is further research to establish just how extensive the problem is. That is the end of part C. You now have two minutes to check your answers.